let's keep going and um, see how we put this to use. So um, here, let me actually make this, because this is what we're going to focus on now. So what we're trying to define is um, basically the, um, let's say we want to evaluate um, equation three. That's a, well, that's the same as evaluating equation six. Um, the term that's going to take the longest to compute or the term that has the largest computational complexity is this final one. So let's focus on this. Um, so we are going to let, um, so basically we want to compute AMPX because that appears here. All right. And so in order to um, show how this works, we're going to define a lowercase a's. So lowercase a sub jt is going to be a t. So the t is the degree um, or the order. And then j is the index of the vectors that you go up to. So um, the p's and the x's are, um, are just the input vectors. But p sub 1 through j is all indices from the first index to the jth index. And again, I really like this notation because this is sort of like what you would see if you were like writing in Python or something like that. Like this colon to go from 1 to j. It just makes a lot of sense. It's very clear that this is entries 1 through j of the vector p. All right, um, so then from equation seven, basically if you compare these things, um, this is just a special case of equation seven. Equation eight is a special case of, of equation seven because AJT, so that's just this thing. Um, so here, um, T is going to be like, um, so yeah, so we look at equation seven. So here a j minus, so let's assume that a j t equals a m p x in this formula. Um, so that means that t is equal to m um, and j must be the length of p and x. Okay. So then this is equal to a j minus one t. So that's, um, the t is still there. So the order is the same. Um, and we're going all the way up to um, all, we are using all in entries except j minus one. So basically here we're, we're using um, equation seven where j is the length of vector p. And so this is just, uh, so um, a j minus one would be p1 through j minus 1, x1 through j minus 1. So this would be p and x without the final entry. Um, plus, we get the pjxj again up here, and then a, and then again we subtract the order, and we again are considering um, the shorter matrices, matrices without that final entry. Okay, so this makes sense. All right, so this gives us a very easy way to compute um, these AMPXs um, because basically you, you can just do this table. Um, I think they defined earlier that um, uh, for t equals zero, um, it was always going to be equal to one. Um, that should be from before. Um, do, do, do. Yes, that's right here. Okay. And so then A11 is going to be A01 plus P1X1 A00. So you do, um, you basically for each entry, for this entry, you go up and you go left and you use those two pieces of information. You also use, um, pj and xj, um, where the j is equal one. So 
how many operations do we need to do to compute this? Um, we um, just need to do what one, two, three. We need two multiplications and an addition. Um, but the point is, it's a constant number of operations. And then, um, but ba so you get you go up, you go to the left, and you use those two pieces of information to get this in a constant number of operations. Then you do the same thing here, you keep going, and then when you get down here, you do the same thing and you keep going. Um, and you just fill out this matrix and eventually you get to ADM. And that's what we're looking for. It's this AMPX value. All right, and how many, uh, how long did it take us to compute this? Um, well, there are M rows and D columns, well, M plus one and D plus one, but Basically, the point is um, the complexity here is going to scale with D and M. And so um, this algorithm takes um, D times M or big O of D times M complexity because that's the complexity for filling out this table. All right, and then you can use these to um, you basically just add them all up together, and that gives you um, the model evaluation. And so that is why. Um, and also, it you also have to um, add it up like km times, um, but km is a constant, so that's not going to grow at all. So we still have big. Uh, we still have complexity big O of D times M. And so that's why we have big O of D times M complexity in uh, the higher order factorization models. Um, now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to worry about the gradients because this is, it, it's going to be a lot of work and I don't personally think it's really necessary. Um, basically, the only reason I wanted to do this was to answer that question from the previous paper of like, is this actually possible? And now I see that yes, it is possible. Um, and it is doable. Um, the fact that it took uh, and, and it's also like, um, it's worth keeping this in mind, like when you're reading papers, um, if you see a, a sentence that says like one can show blah, 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 and um, you think to yourself, wow, this is really seems very hard. Um, is it really as easy as they're making it out to be? The answer might be no. Like it, it might be the case that this is actually a very tricky thing to figure out. And so like, here's an example because that first paper, um, that first paper um, just said in one sentence, like, oh, if you do this for higher order, then it's um, still linear time. Um, and then this is like six years later, um, right, because this is, this is like 2016 and the first paper was like 2010. So six years later, an entire separate paper um, establishes this result. Um, and so, and then they even see, say that, like, unfortunately, there exists to date no efficient algorithm for training arbitrary order. Hey, cut it out. Cats are getting ready for food, and they are agitated because they want to eat. All right. So, unfortunately, there exists to date no efficient algorithm for training arbitrary order, high order factorization machines. And so... Here they do it. Um, but the other thing worth pointing out is that um, even though this is really interesting and really um, good to know that this actually can be done, it seems like this isn't entirely critical to the usefulness of higher order factorization machines. Um, because high order, because factorization machines gained a big um, like th they became a really big thing after they were used to win the Netflix prize problem. And um, obviously they, they, they've been used um, uh, in tons of different applications um, to effectively 
um, provide some sort of personalization. Um, uh, for particularly for companies, you can use them to have like personalized recommendations using user data. But it seems like the using D equals two um, from the factorization machine architecture was enough. Um, and it sort of makes sense if you look at if you remember that example from the first paper um, where they talk about how like um, like the different interactions between the vectors should make it so that you can basically um, information about um, different information about how the columns and how the um, columns in your data interact with each other um, are captured just through d equals two um, and so it's it's very easy to connect long strings or not easy to connect but you can connect strings of different um, uh, columns of data using just d equals two and so it seems like for practical purposes d equals two was sufficient and these higher order factorization machines um, well as mathematicians we always have a tendency to want to generalize as much as possible, it's not always necessary. Um, it's the, just the idea of diminishing, um, diminishing marginal return or whatever you want to think of it as from economics. Um, but anyways, we can now sort of um, uh, resolve this and know that there are higher order factorization machines out there. Um, and they can be computed in linear time relative to um, the data size um, and to uh, whatever the order of the factorization machine is. Um, and yeah, that's what I wanted to go over is to just introduce factorization machines, sort of show like what the equations themselves actually look like. Um, and that's what we've done through reading these papers. So that's how factorization machines work.